Well, let's see. Do you know anybody know of anybody else who's planning to come? Mm -hmm. No? Not, Not anybody from that? Okay then. We will get going. Okay, Lisa, we're gonna get started. Great. Will we be tempted on any of this material? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. This is um when I when we decided to do this, I started with um, uh, the, what I had before, and it's grown about 40 slides since then. So, oh. we, you know, it starts to get a little, um, we'll, we'll speed it up if we're starting to get close on time. But um, this, and doing this first prompt was prompted by Matt, who was very concerned that people didn't understand the problems with VOCs, volatile organic compounds, particularly candles, people burning a lot of candles. And so kind of said, okay, I want that one to be first. So here we go. So um, what's the problem with, with indoor air quality? What are the health effects? We're going to go through. This is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what those health impacts are. We're going to talk about how to avoid them on each one. And then the pollutants that we're going to talk about are here. Organic, volatile organic compounds. We'll kind of describe, if you don't know what some of these are, combustion products, which we're all pretty familiar with, radon, biologicals. Um, respiratory particulates, environmental tobacco smoke, lead, and asbestos. All things that um, we come in contact fairly regularly and probably don't even know it. So, um, just having my computer up, so I, I, with that many slides I have to remember what I'm talking about. Air pollution kills about 7 million uh, people a year. Now, they're not all inside. In fact, most of them we're going to find in the next slide are really outside. And partly due to um, third world countries where they're cooking inside a lot, and that creates a lot of problems. So, fumes from indoor stoves, that type of thing, but we can document that, and we know that that's a big problem. Um, about, and as I said, most of these were indoor, about more than half of them, but close to half of them are deaths from outdoor air pollution. That's also, and, and you can see in that slide before what we were talking about, and, this kind of thing. Well, we're, we're not there yet, and luckily we are taking steps, I believe, in this country to avoid that we're going to have those kinds of problems. Um, so, the problem with, with pollutions in residential is there aren't any good standards for them. We have outdoor pollutions, we have OSHA pollution um, controls for commercial spaces and industrial spaces, but there really aren't any good standards for um, residential settings. Radon is one of the few that we have that for. Um, even when we measure them inside residential, though, they often exceed even the outside measurements. So we really want to be aware of, of where we are and what's going on around us. And part of this is is where we live. Do we live next to an industrial area? Do we live next to a, a busy street, a busy highway, that type of thing? But we're going to get more pollution. Um, better than what it's been. I think it's improving, but there's still issues. We spend about 90% of our time indoors. 65% of that time we spend in our own homes. So our own homes are important for um, being aware of what's going on. Asthma rates have increased dramatically, and I, I was trying to find the most recent one, and this is what I can find um, from 19, or 2013. It usually takes at least a year for those statistics to get looked at and, and put out there. So asthma rates, adults, 18.7 million, about 8% of adults, and about 9.3% of children are with asthma. The cost of asthma last year, or let's say in 2007, which is much greater now than it was then, but that's the latest one I could actually find numbers on, was $56 billion. Um, and worldwide, 334 million people have asthma. So, and asthma is not caused by any one of those things, but asthma is exacerbated by most of those things. So that's why the big awareness of asthma and when I was a kid, I had one kid in my class who had allergies. Not asthma, but just allergies. And now that is so common, and, and we know that you probably grew up with kids who carry the inhalers around, and, and uh, that is not going down. So the problem is there's a broader way, a, array of pollutants now, because we're, we're developing new things, new chemical things, putting together for all the kinds of things that we want. 
and that that the the emissions from those are getting in the air. There are potentially higher emissions for things. There's better measurement detection, and that's really part of it. And some of the people who say, well, it's really not that bad, um, put it on the fact that we now can measure more of that, so there's more statistics on it, and we're more aware of it, which isn't bad, because the people who are affected by these are affected pretty dramatically. Um, for a while, many years ago, um, we became aware of people who had multiple sensitivities to things, and they became sort of a voice in the wilderness because they were very much affected by it, but nobody knew what it was, and they thought they were crackpots essentially because they just they couldn't they couldn't be comfortable anywhere, they had breathing problems, all that kind of thing, and um, so now we now we actually can do some of that me measuring to find out well what. You know, they can actually test the people to see what's, what really is bothering them. Um, we have re reduced air exchanges in the houses, which is, of course, what we are pushing for. Um, build tight, ventilate right. We have poor mechanical ventilation, so the combination of those um, can lead, if they're not in the right order, can, um, can lead to more pollution inside. And the buyers have become more knowledgeable. They're asking for what, what is this going to do to me or what's in this product. Um, and then again, the growing population of, of um, sensitive people. So, and this little guy, some people say we're too clean. Well, that, there's a couple things on that. One is all the cleaning products that we use inside. Um, um, have, you, have you used any of those bubble things in bathrooms that I mean, you can smell that for hours after it's in there, so you know those are VOCs and things that are giving off that probably aren't the best thing. But people are a little reluctant because we think we've been conditioned to think that we need to buy those products to be clean and to be, you know, gosh, we don't want to be the dirty ones. Sanitized, yeah. When actually, and no one wants to go back to mixing lemon juice and vinegar to, to clean things, which will do it just fine, um, or even using some less caustic things. Well, that's pretty the least caustic, but, but less than what those cleaning products are. Um, vinegar for cleaning windows, that kind of thing, that, that really is, is more of a, a natural product. Um, so when we look at the health concerns, we look at a couple things. One is acute problems, and, and the other are the chronic, pro chronic problems. So, and people with asthma have both of these typically. But in some cases, you need to know, and it depends on what this is at any given time, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. So when we talk about the sensitivity, we look at um, age groups, and we looked at what children, children have a pretty high rate of sensitivities, um, the general health of the person, some kind of age, we've got to go to the other end too. Um, older people and younger people tend to have more sensitivities and be affected more by certain things. Um, probably because the age, probably not developed um, bodies well enough to, to accept and ward off some of those things. And then as we age, we get more susceptible to things. We have the less ability to fight those kinds of things off. So when we look at these things, we look at what, what matters is what kind of dose we're getting of something. So if somebody's doing something right in front of your face and you get dosed with something, that's, that's the dosage. And then how long are you, are you in that condition? Or if the dose is really low and you're not in it very long, then you're probably not going to be affected as much. Um, so we look at internal and external, and there, I don't by any means want to say that there are more internal than external. It's just we've grouped them kind of in a bigger group, like the outdoor air. Um, that's, that about covers it. But, Things like attached garages and houses, which um, are a wonderful thing, and nobody's going to give those up. But trying to separate that from the house where we breathe is a huge issue. Um, and when we start talking about carbon dioxide, you can see that some of those numbers and say, holy cow, I better not be warming my car up in the garage if it's attached to my house. Um, loading docks. So uh, uh, early on, and again, this is it's the advantage of living a long time ago. A lot of history. Um, when we were looking, uh, I worked with people who worked in hospitals and hospital air and air quality and um, keeping people safe and, 
and the, the rooms, the um, rooms that were isolated for different things, but particularly with people with chronic illness and HIV and those types of things. And one of the things they found is that oftentimes these were designed so poorly that the intakes for the air would be close to the loading docks. So the diesel trucks and the, all the things that were unloading there, that was, that was where the fresh air was coming. So they're measuring things. So now I think architects and engineers are more aware of that kind of thing so they make sure that doesn't happen. The building when I worked at the university for those years, um, we, had, we always knew when kids were smoking outside of, and those of you who went there, uh, outside of Crawford, um, <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah, it, the kids would go down and smoke, but the intake for the building that I was in, which was got name changed, the big square building on the corner, Pat and I were in that room for years and years, you could smell the smoke mm -hmm. in the building because those kids would stand up right by the intake and it, you know, for those buildings. And then soil gases. Um, I don't know that we're completely aware of all the soil gas problems, but um, some of the issues come out, you know, this isn't soil gas, but um, lead in, in soil. Um, why do we have lead in soil, particularly in cities? Because of the lead gas that was, that was in the gasoline that was given off and it got in the soil. So we have a lot more of that in, in the country in some places than others. We've heard this week, this last week, at least a week, maybe a little longer, about the lead in the water in Flint, Michigan. Um, mm -hmm. Those kinds of things, the, those they, unfortunate things that happen. And of course, some of these things like lead are very dangerous because once you get lead in your body, it doesn't go out and you can accumulate it over the time. So the fact that they didn't do anything about that for several months, I believe it was. I thought it was several years. So, was it years where they had switched the... Was what I read, yeah. Was, okay, <coughs> well, then like those children, thing. yeah, those children then um, who had elevated <coughs> lead levels, um, they're, they're stuck with that. Way. There's only one way, a chelation way, of taking it out of the body where it kind of, where you have to um, absorb a substance that kind of um, binds with the lead. But it isn't any damage that's happened. And the damage can be, um, it's mental, it's, it's all kinds of things, neurological. Um, those, you can't, you can't reverse that once that's happened. So, you want to be careful when kids are playing. That's why we're very careful when we, when we design play areas, parks and stuff, that we check the soil before that's happened and, and get rid of it if it's full of lead and bring more in um, before we put kids in a place where they can be exposed to that kind of thing. And internal, I think one of the, um, all of these things, which we're all aware of, I think one of the big things that's happened during your growing up days is the furnishings. Now, when you try and find wood, solid wood. When I was growing up, every, all the furniture was solid wood because there wasn't anything else. Now with the, um, and, um, the MDFs and all the other glues that are involved in the um, OSB type products, MDF type products, um, are really, you, you can't get away from it. You try and buy a table and it's veneered on the top. Um, you know, the, the fact that we're now getting most of our furniture not from the United States but from, from um, other countries. Sweden. Well, Sweden is pretty good with it, yeah. They're pretty solid. Danish stuff is pretty solid. But but the the, the stuff that people can afford, and particularly uh, students IKEA. can afford. <laughs> IKEA. That's where I was going with that. Yeah. IKEA. Yeah. Okay. Well the IKEA stuff, but the old Danish teak stuff yeah. that's expensive is pretty solid. But right. but yeah, but IKEA um, and who doesn't have something from IKEA? Why why wouldn't you? <laughs> but but I think the thing that you that you can notice is that, and there are some glues that are not as offensive as others, and quite frankly, some of the IKEA stuff, you can off-gas for a long, long time, you, you can smell it, but, but you, your nose tells you a lot, unless you have some problems with your nose, you can tell if you've got something there that is offensive, you know, and, and so we'll talk about some of the ways to, to do that. And then the things that are everywhere, ubiquitous, mold and, and other biologicals, and. And, um, and of course, the combustion equipment, all those types of things. So we'll talk about all of those. Okay, so there are four ways that we can, that, that we call um, avoidance strategies. And the first one is to eliminate, and that's just not bring it in. 
just not buy that stuff. If you if you find something and you take a good whip, walk around it a lot and say, no, I'm not going to bring this in my house, or remove it. If you if you have something that's offensive, whether whether it's not just furniture, but it's a cleaning product that you really, I mean, when you use it, you go, whoa, I'm not going to use that. Get rid of it. Bring it. Take it out. And, or encapsulate it. One of the things that you could do is if you've got if you've got a, a material or that is off-gassing, you can try and seal it. You can paint or varnish or put a sealer on it so that it encapsulates it. That doesn't mean that it's not going to off-gas, but it'll off-gas at a much slower rate and a much slower dosage. So um, that, that's another way you can do it. So encapsulate it. And then the last two are dilution. And this is we're talking mostly about air pollution, where if you ventilate or look for a point source removal, which typically would be a fan right above where you're doing it. Like crafts, I know my, my husband talks about doing a lot of air, building little airplanes when he was young, and he and his friend would get so funny and have so much fun down in that little tiny room they were working in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Getting all high. Yeah, can't imagine yeah. why. <laughs> you know, he grew, he was in college in the, in the 70s, so, you know, it probably <laughs> led to other things. <laughs> but. Um, all other planes are a gateway drug. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so getting general ven ventilation, a good ventilation rate in the house, um, uh, or taking, it has some point source. Um, and then the last thing is filtration. And filtration is really the last one, because filtration isn't always that effective. It, it, can, it can take some things, but it really, it, it can do spot filtration in a room that you have particular issues with. Um, or general filtration through the air handling systems. And that means not the filter that came with the furnace, because that is designed to protect the furnace, not the air. It's the furnace motor, it's not to protect the air. So if you're going to do that, you need to find some different way of doing that. We just, my husband has allergies, so we just um, add an electronic filter to our furnace. Um, and what that is the, cut down on the dust. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. The freestanding units? Yep. Um, for instance, I have a small apartment. I think yep. like maybe six or 700 square feet. Uh -huh. if, um, and it's a big open floor plan yep. with a separate bedroom. So if I had a spot, uh, a freestanding unit in the main big room, would that still be effective sure. for that small space? Sure. Okay. Yeah, and when you when you buy them, it'll tell you how many square feet it will cover. Oh, sure. And then you need to be careful about the filters and make sure they get cleaned and things like that. Right. So it, it can be effective. Okay. You just want to not, I don't think we even talk about this in here, but you do not want to buy any ozone. <laughs> ozone, don't, but stay away from the ozone. Cleaners, are split. they say it cleans the air, but it can cause major problems. Oh, I've problems. never heard of that as a, as a product. It's a product, yes. They used to use it to get rid of the cigarette smoke, yes. right? Yes. Oh, okay. And they use it, they still use it, and it's it's okay to use it when nobody's in there, like for fires um, or for things like that. Yeah. But sometimes, I remember a couple of my colleagues who were big into building science would make sure, ask if they had ozone cleaners in the rooms, and then they would say, turn them off or I'm not staying here. Okay. Because it can cause major health issues. Um, yeah. So... <coughs> particularly with like pets and people with any kind of heart problems or anything like that. Hi. Okay, so we're going to go through biologicals, VOCs. I, I, this might be in a little different order as we go through them, but we'll start in. Okay, the thing about biologicals is sometimes they're really gorgeous when <laughs> you get down to the, to the microscopic level. Um, Cockroaches, dust mites. Who doesn't? Who's who knows about the mattress and the dust mite and that? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Ten years. Something I had like forty percent of the way. I had a vacuum demonstration. Oh, you did. Okay. <laughs> well, you, a, you can't get away from the dust mite sure things you. because they're just they're ubiquitous too. Um, yeah. Moisture, you know, if you have your mattress, the weight will double in eight to ten years, something like just that. Just from, from dust, dust mites and your skin. Because the, the dust mites eat the dead skin and you can't, they're like, I mean, they're really microscopic, you can't see them. But they also are affected by humidity. They will grow faster and more bigger numbers in humidity. So we should vacuum our mattresses? Yes. You, you should, or they actually have covers now that's sort of protected. You wash them and take them off. But also dust mite, here's, here's one of, this is one of my soap boxes. Dust mite 
are killed at about 135 degrees. But now we've all turned our hot water down to 120, which won't kill them. So, you know, there's a trade-off with safety and making sure that you can kill some of those things. Um, so let's talk about each of them. So biologicals, we're talking about, we'll talk about each of these real quickly. Um, the health effects are eye, ears, no irritate, throat irritation, excuse me, shortness of breath, dizziness, fever. I mean, you're going to find that most of the things we talk about have very similar symptoms. So depending on how they affect your body, whether you're inhaling them or ingesting them or, um, or coming through your skin or whatever, um, digestive problems, allergic problems, asthma. Now they will not, again, they won't cause asthma. They just exacerbate it. There's no, uh, there's no proof, and they've done some pretty heavy duty studies. The um, Center for De Disease Control uh, did, it. this is probably in the 90s somewhere, where they came out and said um, that mold, all these things do not cause asthma, which, which is what everybody was trying to say at the time, but they did a pretty thorough study on that. No one's, no one's um, uh, questioned that yet. So for biologicals, one of the biggest things is moisture control. Keeping the level, you know, humidity, humidity levels low, the moisture levels low. Point source ventilation, if you have problems in one area, um, general ventilation and dehumidification, which is going to address that. So, um, you know, what we find is in basements or I now have a, a raised ranch, so there's living space in the lower level, that there's more moisture in there. And, and it's more subject to having um, uh, problems. Sometimes just the odor from the moisture and the, you have to be careful about what you do and that's what we talk about trying to tell people, make sure you get, if you're going to have a, a lo lower level below gray space that it's warm and dry. And warm means insulating it, new house is insulated on the outside and underneath the slab so that, so that things are kept dry and that will avoid a lot of the biologicals. Um, integrated pest management. So one way of, of approaching these is it's a combination of things, you know, and so when they first started talking about integrated pest management, it was like a lot of the people who were very sensitive to chemicals that said, well, we can do this without chemicals. And what they've really decided is that sometimes you can't do all of it without some type of chemicals. So be, but you should be aware of the chemicals that you're using, how much you, of them you are using, and, um, and um, just, just be very aware and informed about what you're doing when you're trying to take care of things. Um, you know, this, this, this season people who live in the country or in uh, rural spaces and even in town where there's a lot of woods and stuff, mice can be a problem. Some of the things you can do to avoid mice, you seal up for one thing, make sure you're sealing room joists and make sure your foundation is sealed so that they don't have ways to get in. But um, somebody just told my husband, um, a farmer, said, put those little drier things around. They don't like things that smell good. <laughs> so I don't know if that works or not, but one of his patients told him that. Um, and, uh, and this is, again, just another a schematic of looking at training people, the education of making sure that things are kept dry, they're kept clean, that they're not, there are not things in there that were, are appealing to pets. Um, cockroaches need moisture. And, um, so if you're keeping things dry, keeping things cleaned up, trying to look for places where they would come in and control them, then then you're you're looking at an overall way to manage that. Mm -hmm. Lisa, feel free to jump in if you have questions along the way. Thank you. I will. Thanks. Okay. So reducing dust mites. Um, can you see? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, the relative humidity at 50 below. Now. People have different feelings about what relative humidity can be. But humans can be, and I can tell you that there are, there is a plethora of research that, you, that just doesn't stop about that higher levels of humidity cause respiratory illness. And um, even in, in children, particularly in older people. So the fact that you've got to have really a lot of humidity for kids or for anything is really not true. Um, 
So keep the relative humidity at below 50%. And in the wintertime, you know, you may get, you may walk to a light fixture and get a spark, but that really isn't going to hurt you. We live very comfortably at 20% relative humidity. Um, so you, you may get, you know, when you take your clothes off, they may spark a little bit, but it's really not going to hurt you. And it certainly is better than having over humidity and then having some of the respiratory problems that you may get with that. You can encase your mattress and pillows with this dust proof, and, but that means that you need to wash them frequently or you're not you can negate the, all of that. Um, wash your beddings and blankets once a week, 135 to 140 degrees, which we just don't do much. Um, I think part of it is that push to not use the hot water to reduce the, um, the, uh, what, what we have to spend for energy. But um, I, I, I do think that getting 130, 135 will kill most of those things. And you don't do it on everything. You just do it on your sheets and, and um, things that, bedding kind of things. Um, use bare floors. We see this a lot. It's a more of a trend because it's upscale. To, and in older houses, 1920s and 30s, um, much easier to keep it, keep things off that. Um, I had a friend who did a bunch of research on carpets. And um, okay. that, um, that did a bunch of research on carpets in, in lower levels, and the amount of dust mites he found on that was pretty, um, pretty um, interesting. Um, yeah, and he had a product actually that was a, a, a dehumidifier that was freestanding in the basement. It was called Decatherm. De Decatherm, yeah. That's what it was. Um, that worked quite well. Uh, don't use it. Don't use a dry cloth to dust since it stirs up, gets it in the air. So use a damp cloth of some kind or with some kind of spray on it or whatever. That again is going to have a little bit of VOC in it. Um, make sure these are these are becoming much more common. We see these. You can almost buy. I mean, Target wherever you find this kind of thing to get a HEPA filter <coughs> that um, will we'll stop that. And then I. I don't do this. I, you know, if you have so, if you have um, some type of respiratory issue or something, you certainly can do that, and, and people should if they do have that. Okay, mold. I had a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are the health? So, if you're not allergic to dust mites, what are the what are the negative health effects? Well, um, most people, even if they're not allergic, it's not an allergy particularly. It's just a it's just a respiratory thing that can build up over time. Okay. Yeah. So you won't necessarily get the you won't allergy end up symptoms of sleep? No. Well, you won't get the same as seasonal like allergies or what? When you when there are a lot of dust mites, is it similar reaction to like seasonal allergies? Some people do have that, yep. Or just in general it would be in general, yeah. Okay. It can it can affect. Over and over time it can. Um, this is a house that um, we did a bunch of research in to try and figure out why this was happening. And this is mold. There actually, I, it's, I, I know I have a picture of it somewhere, I couldn't find it. There was actually mold growing on the glass of the windows <laughs> in this house. And every window had some mold on it like this. This house was built too low in the ground and had no drainage away from it. Um, we tried everything. I'm guessing the house isn't there anymore. But a family with five kids moved into this house with no respiratory problems and and four of the kids ended up with some major issues mm -hmm. after yeah. living in this house for a couple of years. And it was a brand new house. Um, just not just not built correctly. Um, so and <coughs> so we'll talk a little bit about mold. Would uh, would excavating the foundation and installing drain tile have helped? Um, actually um, they did that but it just was so so much moisture coming in there that they couldn't really stop it. Oh. And I think there might be a picture of the basement in here somewhere, um, but it, it just, the humidity level, was they just could not control it. Yeah. What, 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 it, what should have happened was the house should have been raised. They could have moved it up and added two or three courses to the, to the basement and, um, and then had the drainage away. But at that time, that seemed like very expensive, and so I'm not sure what really happened to that house. I, don't know I can even think I could even go figure out where it was and go drive by it. So, um, mold and mildew, which 
again, it's everywhere. Um, uh, till 1969, they they were putting mold and mildew in with plants, but they're not they're not the same. Mold can actually make its own food where plants can, so they actually in 1969 gave it its own kingdom. Yeah. Um, so mold does a lot of good things for us. Think about penicillin, the antibiotics, other um, health drugs that it's in. Um, and of course, we couldn't live without wine and beer. Right. Um, and it breaks down dead things. We would be miles and miles high of full of debris and dead plants and dead trees and all that kind of stuff if we didn't have mold to break it down and, and eat it, essentially. Um, and even like things like flavorings. There's Lots of things you can think about that have mold in it. Um, so there's about 100,000 species of fungi or mold that have been identified, and there are lots to be left to be identified. It's just, it's just ongoing. Um, they, they have to gain their nutrients from other um, organic substances. So I think we talked about this. So if you've ever if you've ever grabbed a piece of fruit or something, which those little oranges that are out now, you get a bag of them and about four or five of them are just mush. And if you leave them for too long, they'll be moldy. Um, that's, that's where the mold is actually digesting some of that orange. Um, and I think in just a minute or two, we'll talk about what they have to have. So they need, first of all, you have to have the mold spores. And then you have to have a food source, which for mold can be just about anything. Um, and uh, appropriate temperature, which is about the temperature that we live at. Um, so it's pretty, um, pretty great, a wide range. Um, and some moisture. And that's all it needs. Um, dry airborne spores can be inhaled. So that's why when you've got um, kids with asthma, you want to keep the mold down, that's why they talk about keeping clean surfaces, no stuffed animals, you know, they have stuffed animals have to slowly walk away, things like that when kids are, are um, diagnosed with, with asthma. Um, and proper respirator, if you're, if you're working in an area where you know there's mold spores, and I think farmers have to be very careful about this kind of thing because they're exposed to it all the time, and there are other, other different um, jobs that have the same kind of thing for exposure. People working in houses. People working inside the building houses that are being built. There's just a lot of stuff being stirred up and mold is in that mix. So uh, respiratory illness triggering all kinds of different things. Again, these are they're gorgeous. But not so gorgeous when you're looking, I think the next picture is looking here. Yeah. It looks like bad wallpaper. It does. <laughs> There's some that it just does look like, some of it looks like nice wallpaper, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like you go to look. Velvet wallpaper. Velvet wallpaper, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, no, yeah. And this is not untypical in lots of older homes. So you see that, and, and it's, um, this is probably typically caused by you, you know, you know there's going to be something for the for it to eat down there, um, so it's a matter of just controlling the moisture. Keep it away. Yeah. And then a little guy there. I had one of those in my locker in junior high. One of these? Yep. What is Science that? Project. Science Project. <coughs> what is that? That's, That's an orange. orange. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> that okay. the mold is eating away. Gotcha. Different kinds of mold. Well, yeah. I just cleaned my refrigerator out and found some. Okay, so mold does not need bleach to kill it. it detergent will kill, will kill the mold. Um, however, mold spores will remain, they'll remain dormant if the humidity level is low. But if the moisture level goes up again, those spores will all of a sudden decide they can eat again and they'll grow. So you want to be very careful when you get rid of mold that you keep the moisture low. It's really difficult in those old basements to do that. So dehumidification um, down there, um, which we recommend for older homes, you know, don't add moisture 
don't, you know, another one of my soapboxes is the humidifiers that go in furnaces should be banned. They should not be <laughs> allowed to be in, put in. Um, we can live in, in our climate very nicely without adding much humidity at all. Um, keep the house dry and the humi humidity levels low and you avoid lots of mold issues. So, do you know, are you familiar with the white paint called Kills? Yes. Does that actually work or does it not? Um, it, it's kind of, it's supposed to cover it up essentially, you know, but you need to clean. Kills really is designed to do that to some extent. But it also is designed to, to sort of protect from moisture. I mean, I think they sell it for that, like keep the moisture out. It doesn't it's really specifically work for that. sold for like the whole kills. It's yeah. killing the mold. Yeah, and um, no, it, it it doesn't. It's not very fungicidal. No. no. Okay. Uh -huh. hmm. After the fun fungicide to kill it, but I mean, when you put the kills on, you if you don't if you don't have if the moisture's still coming in behind it. It's going to get through eventually, and you're going to have it. So you just like scrub it with a so, detergent yeah, brush. So yeah, but if, if you have some mold that you've cleaned off, you've got the house dry, and you use kill to just to just cover it before you put some other finish on it, it can work in that case. But for basements, it's pretty. It's not really good. worth buying. No. As opposed to cleaning it and just using regular paint. Yeah. Yeah. That's but, what I thought. And then keeping it dry. I mean, the whole point is keep it dry afterwards. So if you keep it dry, the kills will work just fine. <laughs> so something else, or figure out a different thing to do besides paint it, because hydrostatic pressure is incredibly powerful. So if you've got moisture behind those walls, you you're kind of fighting fighting a flood. You know? So you really have to. The better thing would be is to let the moisture come through and dehumidify it, or do something. Keep it air conditioner in the summertime. Run the air conditioner and reduce the humidity. Okay, so anybody guess what this one's going to be about? Volatile organic compounds. Yeah. Oh, I have one more question. On oh, okay. Mold. Is it common for mold or like certain substances to grow in? Is it possible for the in the radiator? With the I mean, in your car, with just the heating system, is it possible for that to come in? I. Oh yes. Oh yes, are you talking about like when you turn the when you turn the fan on and you get the smell? Yeah. Yes, it is. What was the question? With you, you can, know when uh, you turn your heater on or air conditioner on in the summer and you get this awful smell. Yeah. You know? You're supposed to flush that. Or? Well, lots of uh, lots of cars now have uh, cabin air filters, and uh, they are increasingly uh, using activated carbon in those filters for that very reason, so that anything that does. Uh, accumulate in the, the ventilation system and passes through that and then, you know, whatever stench you get from it gets filtered out. But for cars that don't have that, just open your window for yeah. a minute. So you have to kind of just blow it out and let it get Pretty much. dry. You, it, you just go through a week or so, exactly. depending on how much you drive. I sne I've been like sneezing and yeah. kind of in I'm the sure. car with the heat, so I'm just wondering. With the heat? Hmm. Yeah, when I got the heat going. I'm wondering if it has you something can to do have that. The, you can have them cleaned out, but I have no idea what it costs to do that. Yeah. But heat, you typically see that in more in the spring. But you wouldn't get that from the heat exchanger, because that's no. hot coolant running yeah. through, mm -hmm. which is 210 degrees. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well over the 130 you need to kill yeah. the bacteria. Yeah. Huh. So yeah, they, they may be growing further downstream. Yeah. 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 OK, so as you can see, all the organic compounds are kind of, if you go online and look for images, which is where I got most of these, you'll find that it, it's just everywhere. Everywhere. They are everywhere. Everywhere, yeah. Again, a lot of these things are ubiquitous, no question about it. So this this is just a little, little bit of where we can find these things. But and pesticides is a big one. Any kind of solvents. Okay, first of all, right. Volatile organic compounds are compounds that will get into the air at room temperature. So they don't have to be heated up to give off um, the pollutants. The, um, they'll do it at room temperature. So um, pesticides, solvents, disinfectants, all these kinds of things, mothballs, um, all these. It's in here, ozone generating machines are the same way. Um, they give off VOCs. 
Okay. So, oh, more. Things that we do, building materials that we see, um, things that we do in the house, um, photocopying, smoke, of course, smoking, which we shouldn't do, space heaters, those kinds of things will all give off VOCs. Um, health impacts are not are not um, minuscule. They're not. Um, they're they're important and they're very. Um, they can be very damaging. This is from a pesticide. This is why we talk about in third world countries where kids are sent out to do things unprotected with bare feet and they get into all kinds of different um, pesticides and things when they're out picking um, uh, cocoa. Um, things. Uh, my niece who has a, a non-profit that documents some of these things was in, I forget what country she was in, uh, Liberia I think, and did a, a documentary on the kids that were sent out without boots and trying to raise money to get boots for the kids, at least so when they're out picking and out walking around and, and all the pesticides that were used. Um, and just the little, I love that picture of that little red-headed kid coughing. Um, headaches, respiratory, neurological, loss of coordination, some of which doesn't go back. I mean, you may have these for a while, but some of these stay with them. Um, all these kinds of things. And then we get down to things like central nervous system disorders, which again, stay with you, don't, don't go away. Cancer, chromosome damage that can just carry on from generations. So it, it, isn't, um, it isn't for the faint of heart and it's something we should pay attention to. Um, what do we do? Inspect, look in your house for things that, that you can get rid of, you don't need, you can find a different uh, substitute for. Um, making careful selections of materials that you bring into the home, source control, allowing furniture to, furniture to off gas. So if you've got one of that piece of furniture and you love it and you want to keep it, leave it in the garage or leave it outside for however long it takes to when you bring it in you don't smell it anymore. Typically on those types of things you can smell it. Um, seal and encapsulate like we talk about. And then use good general house ventilation. That's that after it's after it's even off gas, just for in general for everything. Good um, fresh ventilation will go a long way. Um, I, I want to. So, so I didn't talk as much about candles as I, as I wanted to because somebody was really upset about the candles. <laughs> but the candles will not only they give off VOCs, and you know this is what when we looked at that one picture of all the these kinds of things, you can see um, the glues. But I thought there was one of the candles that they give off VOCs, and they also give off soot. And so the soot can get in and irritate you, and it can land on things, and it can do ghosting, what we call. So we've been in houses where there were so many candles going that when you took off, you took a picture off the wall, you could see where the picture was because the wall around it was blackish that maybe you couldn't see because of color paint or something. And then, of course, if you, you have that much going on and you've got an, like a bathroom light, and of course that soot is drawn to that area and you'll have all kinds of soot in here on that. So you can kind of look and see some of it, but a lot of the stuff you can't see. So I see like the Glade thing too, oh, like yeah. a lot of the uh, freshener, the sprays. Yep. What's uh, your recommendation for like the alternative, like clean? Way yeah. <laughs> clean. I mean, Keep your house clean. Oh, that's not fun. Well, clean yeah, because really, yourself. what what these things do, where are they? These things, and these things, is they're covering up other odors. A lot of time, dog odors. A lot of time, moisture problems that are not taken care of. Things like that. So really, it's sort of yeah. like the integrated pest management. What you really need to do is go back and figure out why is the smell. I mean, if you've got a dog, you need to vacuum more. You need to brush the dog outside. Do things like that. Um, if you've got moisture problems, you need to take care of that. So you're not, or you need to get good ventilation. I think a match works good for the bathroom. <laughs> it does for a right, short time. Right the <laughs> and you're probably not going to get dosed much with, the can with that one match. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Or a fan. Fan in the bathroom works pretty well. Yeah. I think so. yeah. so, yeah. So I, it just, I, I really have to not look at that row at Target. I just do that <laughs> like this. Because it's just, 
it, and it's dangerous. <clears throat> it's dangerous. That baby, you need to keep those candles in, off of that baby comes. <laughs> so you, you work on that. Um, okay, so I think we were on to um, combustion pollutants. <clears throat> I think we're all pretty familiar with these gas, oil, wood fire equipment. Um, the pollutants are going to be carbon dioxide, of course, we put first because that's the one that's going to kill you quickly. Um, nitrous oxides, which cause all kinds of respiratory illnesses. <coughs> these all do uh, cause respiratory problems and, and can cause headaches and other neurological problems, too. So, perfect combustion is carbon dioxide, water, and probably some nitrous oxides. But essentially what happens is you end up with heat and CO2. And, um, and that, but if you get imperfect combustion, when, the, when there's not enough air, or there's something that's suppressing this, this um, process, then you can end up with carbon monoxide. And, um, and probably some other stuff too, some of the other stuff we talked about, respiratory particles, um, things like that, other bad stuff. So, I think, yeah, we'll talk about why we get that. So, strategies to avoid that, I should have talked about why it happens, but, um, and we'll, we'll get to there when we talk about carbon dioxide. Use sealed or power vented equipment. We have, my son and I just moved to a house in April that has an atmospherically vented water heater that was orphaned. And it, it's, 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 it's functioning okay now, it's got a pretty good draw, but I don't want to live with that. And it not only was it orphaned, it was put into a, from a normal size vent to a vent size that now is illegal. Exactly. So, it, you know, if in fact something happened to turn that around, we would have, we could have some carbon dioxide issues because it, the, the, the burning process would not have an oxygen to burn correctly, enough oxygen to burn correctly. Okay, so you want to control for negative pressure of the natural draft equipment, which I'm just talking about. You know, if we turned our dryer on, our kitchen fan, which actually does go to the outside, and other things, and maybe we had the fireplace, we have a couple of fireplaces, which are fighting to get the gas, but, um, hmm. but um, they draw pretty well, but as they cool down, you can get, and you've got a fan on or something, you could reverse that and bring carbon dioxide back into the house. Um, vent your, make sure the dryers and other things are vented properly. <coughs> so this is the dryer, make sure the dryer goes to the outside for all kinds of reasons, moisture and the possibility of, of, of um, things not working correctly and backdrafting other equipment like the furnace. Um, this is a direct vent, somewhat direct vent, um, furnace, which we're, we're seeing more now. Um, that's that's a good thing. Yeah? Uh, my house didn't come with like a arrangement or a... Yeah. What, what, not, what do I do about that? Well, it, how old your house? It's over 100 years old. Okay. Is that, is You're that probably legal probably now? Fine. <laughs> yeah. Your house You're is probably, probably about 12 hundred changes per hour. Yeah. And but like when I'm like right over the... I know, it's yeah. it's a problem and... Um, is it legal for for, oh, yeah. for renter, renters to, if you have a gas range stove, to not have exhaust? It's yeah. electric. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yours is electric? It's it's electric. It's then it's just the smells and the cooking odors and yeah. the grease yeah. and all that so stuff. Yeah. 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 But but it still is irritating and it can, yeah. it can cause problems. But, but there isn't anything that says in the code that you have to have a exhaust fan above the stove that goes out, but it certainly does source point a lot of those issues. Mm -hmm. um, but in an older house it's very difficult because oftentimes you can't find a cavity yeah. to get out. Mm -hmm. um, we lived in a house with a brownstone for 20 years that was built in 1896. It was a brick building, um, you know, it was three layers of brick and it was stone. and um, we ended up going down below in the basement and getting a, a, a downdraft fan that, that was about this big <laughs> to get the pole to get out. Oh. Um, so it it's a challenge in yeah. older homes mm -hmm. to get it to get them yeah. done. Well, I've got gas in a 90-year-old house, and I just rely on the fact that it's leaking, leaking. in the sieve. Yeah. yeah. To you know, yeah. yeah, I can agree with that. Um, 
it's just, you know, your odors don't go away quickly and that kind of thing. And yeah, I mean, so it is, but it, it depends, I guess, on how much you cook. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay, carbon monoxide. I, like, I always like to put a little box here with nothing in it because you can't smell it, you can't see it, you don't know it's there until you're, until you're calling the 911 or somebody else's. Um, it's odorless, it's colorless, it's produced by that incomplete combustion. Um, furnaces, water heaters, motor vehicles, all those things that we live with every day can produce it if, it, if it's not, if we don't have it. And again, the incomplete combustion ends up with water, carbon dioxide, and some carbon. And what we really want is, is just carbon dioxide and then some water and the process is working, and the heat. So what we're after is heat, and what we're getting, if it doesn't work right, and we don't have the right mix of what needs to be there, uh, we get CO. So this is why carbon dioxide is so dangerous. Um, it enters the bloodstream when you inhale it. Um, it. It disrupts the oxygen, the delivery of oxygen to the body by combining with the hemoglobin. So it essentially replaces the, hemo the oxygen with hemoglobin, the oxygen. And, um, it's the affinity for CO and the hemoglobin is 270 times greater than the affinity of oxygen and hemoglobin. So you can see that that's a huge issue because you cannot live without oxygen. And essentially, um, the oxygen gets depleted and, and you can't live that way. You suffocate. You suffocate, essentially, yes. Now, um, it also, the, the symptoms are, are um, I can't think of the right word. They're, they're not good. <laughs> and, and it can sneak up on you. And it mimics other things. So what it can cause is dizziness, headache, you know, some of the, some of the really sad stories and things that we've investigated and been involved with over the years have been kids who have flu-like flu symptoms. And so they go to school and they come home and they, they oh, you've just got the flu. And, um, and so they don't think about it. One family in particular that was not actually that far from here um, had a blended family. And every time the, kid, the kids would um, come, the kids that didn't live there all the time came, um, they would get sick and they'd go home and they'd be fine. And they, the doctors, they'd been to the doctors, and the doctors said, ah, the young kids, they just pick up stuff and it's fine. And uh, with a pregnant mother in the house also. Um, and those kids ended up um, with, uh, with diminished capacity mentally, um, where they didn't have that before. And uh, the child, the baby ended up with some problems, and the family nearly died. Um, and the house had been checked by the heating contractor three times. Um, essentially what happened was they had a, fire, the, a gas fireplace that was not correct, and they had a a particular brand and style of furnace that backdrafted easily, and when it would start to backdraft, it wouldn't stop. How and did they so, not find that when they went to check it? Um, good question, and I don't know how the lawsuit ever ended up, but it doesn't matter That's what the scary. lawsuit did, those kids ended up with diminished capacity. Yeah, it, it, was, it was frightening. We ended up, they, of course they left the house, and we got to use the house to do research for a long time, and so we, we set up all kinds of equipment in the house, and then put it in motion, what we thought was happening, and then we had to go in and shut everything off and, and the... Let it clear for a bit. Let it clear for a bit before we went in because one of the measurements in a bathroom, the master bathroom, was 12,000 parts per million within nanoseconds. Yeah, I don't know how they lived, actually. But you can get all these kinds of things. But the, the big things are the headaches and dizziness and orientation, um, coma, visual things, um, diseases. Um, what we found out, what we found out over time, is that a lot of older people who live alone, and they don't really maintain their equipment very much, and they're not really aware of things that that were thought to have died of heart disease, actually died of carbon monoxide poisoning, mm -hmm. because they just they're firm, they keep it low. They don't, you know, they don't keep it up, so it's not working properly. So again, all of these different things. Um, death, and I've got a chart here in, if you want. Does that chart. family have a carbon monoxide detector? Do you know? Um, yeah, no, I, yes. Okay, 
I'm just wondering how okay. But safe to rely on carbon monoxide detectors. Here, here's the thing with carbon monoxide detectors, and I think there's a slide on this. I can't believe I left that out. But the standard changed, and, and I spent six years fighting the standard to be changed. Because you used to be able to, um, it, would, it would start alarming when you had like 15 parts per million in, in the house. And uh, let, let's find that chart so I can talk about it more. So again, here are some of, the, some of the issues. All issues that you might attribute to some other kind of disease mm -hmm. or some other kind of issue. Um, and I'm not sure why this one got in here, but we'll cover it since it's here. The, we used to have um, real high levels of carbon monoxide from cars. We still do when they start up. But once you get a catalytic converter, the amount is, is, is reduced significantly. Um, but they still aren't very effective during cold startups, and we have cold startups here. Um, um, not just cold, but really cold startups. Mm -hmm. um, and any kind of, if you've got a hole in the exhaust and the vehicle's not moving, you can still get, there's still a bunch of research on kids that have died in backs of pickups, things like that, where, where the topper was on, you know, they put them in the, I'm not sure why you would do that, but, but anyway. Um, the 80s happened. Yeah. You, could, you could do that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's, yeah, let's talk about this and then we'll go back and see if we missed anything. So here are some of the levels. So if you smoke, you have a level of about this in, with, all the time. But otherwise, um, three to seven, you have a 6% increase in the admission of hospitals for non, for non elderly for asthma. So it's affecting asthma and other kinds of issues. But um, the standard, ASHRAE standard for, oh, this is indoors for eight hours, and this is for the workplace only. There isn't one for residential. Um, but the, we'll talk about the Clean Air Act too in a minute. So this is associated with increase of heart disease, 10 parts per million. So you get in these, what, what they would consider lower levels. And this, this is the onset of exercise. If you start exercising, you can get heart problems, um, with a health, I mean, these are things that have been documented over and over and over again. And then you get up to parts where you start to get um, the, do they give me some of the, where you start to get feeling like you have the flu or you get the headaches or that kind of thing, and you get the headaches pretty low. And then you get up to where you get to 400, where you start to get the headaches, and then 800, you start to get nausea, dizzy. These are high levels. And then death in one hour for 800 or less than that and this is it, and then, then you're done so um but here's the standard it changed in 2004 it used to alarm it used to be you used to be able to get a carbon dioxide tell you, it would tell you if you had one or two parts per million which probably you should have none so we used to tell people if you have one or two, you need to have somebody come in and think why you're having one or two. Um, you know, a lot of times gas ranges will, when you start them, they'll get up a little high in gas ovens. When you turn up, you can get up to 50 parts per million, and then it dissipates really quickly. Mm -hmm. That That isn't good, but it's probably, it's not going to kill you, and it's probably not going to be lasting. But, um, but what happened was, they, the standard changed, and I can tell you why it started. There was an inversion, you know what an inversion is in the air? Mm -hmm. Where the, the air comes down, it can't move, and it kind of hovers mm -hmm. over. And so in Chicago, the fire department had something like 1,500 calls from people with carbon monoxide detectors going off. Mm -hmm. And it cost them at that time about $1,000 to $1,500 every time the fire truck went out. So they started this massive thing across the country that said, we can't have these, we can't, this is, we can't afford this, we've got to change the standard. So the standard now, rather than tell you what it is, and alarming at 30, where you get up to 30, where you start to get some real health issues, but I, we'll come back and talk about these lower levels in a minute. But, um, so now, the one that you buy in the store, now, will not alarm unless you have 30 parts per million, above 30 parts per million for 30 straight days. What? So if it ever drops below that, it starts over again. 
Now, I can give you the name of somebody that you can get one that shows you what it is all the time, but it's $225. <laughs> but it's worth it, so you can yeah. look if you're worried about it. So, um, yeah. 30 At days? Like 30, 30 days. straight days? At least 30, 30 straight days. So like you can die in an hour from this stuff. How is that legal? Um, well, if it gets up to 70, I believe it, it, it has, and if it comes to 70, it will alarm. But, it, but you can have these low levels now. That all the research over the years has found that low levels of carbon monoxide, even as low as 15, over a long period of time will affect memory. Mm -hmm. You can have memory loss, you can have um, neurological problems, that type of thing. And of course, it affects young kids and older people more quickly. Um, so yeah, it, it's a bad standard. Wow. Um, and I think you can you can go. I think, Thanks, Chicago Fire. Yeah, yeah. Um, fire is king in this world. Because yeah. um, they so and and we also know that that doctors aren't aware of the of the you know we that task force I was on that we kind of gave up after six years. We would go to hospitals talk to doctors because it's one of the most misdiagnosed issues out there. Um, we have people who were diagnosed with mental illness because and it was CO poisoning people who that they said they had appendicitis and it was carbon monoxide. It was I mean th there's a plethora. They don't have an easy test for that. It's there's um, carboxyhemoglobin. Yeah, yeah. You can, can you do that? There can is you a test blood for a test. Simple blood test. There is a blood test that will tell you how much um, carbon monoxide the, car the carboxyhemoglobin. And doctors won't ever. Do well, they, they don't even think about it. They don't it. think about it, yeah. And they, they don't have, you know, they don't have a context for why would this person have that. Mm. Um, so, they, well, yeah, and they, don't, they aren't trained to even think about it. But I think it, it is getting a little better, but this is still, you know, there's this company called CO Experts. He's been on a lifelong mission <laughs> to fight this, and he has a product that will last several years it will tell you when it's one, two, three, four parts per million. I bought them for my kids for Christmas. What was the name of it? CO Experts. But it's like over 200? Yeah. I was just going to say you can't buy like a simple investor, one that, will, that the yeah. alarm won't go up, but it will at least tell you. I'm not in, they're not in the United States. I think you can go to Canada and get some and we'll show you the levels. So we got to smuggle they some across the border? Make one. Do they make ones that don't necessarily tell you the level, but will alarm if it peaks to like 30 no. a single time uh, instead of uh, for 30 no. days it straight. has to meet the, to be sold in america it has to meet this standard wow C -O yeah. so the george, standard is george kerr is his name it can't alarm until it's been right. parts per million yep. for 30 days yep yeah. and that is not that that's just it's not right but i gave up so what if uh what if Jonathan and I decide to go into business and uh, you know, instead of selling carbon monoxide alarms, start selling carbon monoxide gauges? I don't, I don't or know. Detectors? Yeah. Like, yeah, why couldn't we do that? Well, versus gauge the, I don't know. You'd have to monitor. Look, you'd have to look at. Yeah. I, I don't know. Mm. Is this it? <laughs> yep. Interesting. Yep. Yeah. That's it. You should post it on Podio. We're on the. You should post some yeah. on Facebook. Page. Okay, so <laughs> you want to make sure that your combustion, to protect yourself, you want to make sure that everything's working properly. Use zero combustion if you can. Automobiles, even a properly working gas engine on start it will get to 30,000 30, parts per million before it reaches the catalytic converter. So there's still a period of time when you do that. So what we tell people is don't Start your car in the garage. If you need to warm it up, back it out of the car. Shut the garage door. Because you're, the garage is going to be at a lower pressure than the house. You're going to have moving into the house. And we've studies on this. I can go. So you're saying yes, those garage, leaks yeah. in my, I should get those leaks in my exhaust system fixed in our car. Yes. <laughs> yes, you should. That's what I'm saying. Boy. Doesn't, yeah. Don't uh, auditors have just those little things that will start going off? At yeah, the auditors can, can carry. They don't. I don't know that they go off, but they will tell you what it is. Yeah, so can't we just buy one of those? One. You could. 
and just wear it all the time. Let it sit in your house. <laughs> yeah, it'd be like a pace, the new pacemaker. You just wear it all the yeah, time. The personal ones. I'll, so you could probably buy one of those for a lot cheaper yeah. than two hundred something. Yeah, I don't know how. I don't know what the battery life is, and I don't know what. I should look into that because that would be useful. You could. Pro I mean, it would be a little, a little bit of work, but you could probably take it apart and. Hook it up so that you can plug it in. Yeah. Also, <laughs> worth noting, really isn't it true that uh, carbon monoxide detectors have a limited lifespan? Yes. Mm -hmm. Unlike five, detectors? typically get five years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you need to put when you buy them. If you you need to put the date on them, you bought it, and then check it every you know once in a while. Yeah. They also have checks where you can look and see. Some of them have you can push a button and see what the level is. But yeah, it's 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 work, but we're still not protected as much. But it's better it's better than it was. So let's see. So I think I think we've gone over this enough that we you know, I just can tell that it's one of my soapboxes. Um, now there is some good news with this. Um, the outdoor emissions declined about 23 percent in the 80s, um, mid 90s. Okay, we're we're going to talk about what this is at the end of this session. Um, motor vehicles fell about a third, even though we had a 40% increase in the miles that were driven. Um, there's no good CO numbers in homes, none. There just isn't anything. Um, what it is. Now, this is, these are trends. So these are good. Um, these are, this is regional, and um, this is upper Midwest, and this is national, of, and this is the national standard. Um, eight hour, and the, and these are eight hour averages. So we can see that that is going down. So that's good. But it's, it's only good if you're looking at a big picture. It's not so good if it's just you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, radon. Now we did, how many of you were at the radon presentation? Were you on there? With, with, um, at the company meeting? Yeah, with Josh Kerber. Okay, well, we'll go through this pretty quickly. Radon is a, um, it's a soil gas. It, it comes from it comes from soil gas. It comes from stone, rock, concrete. Water. There's a miner for water. The health effects you sent to your cancer. Um, it's the second leading cause um, of lung I got that wrong on podio. It's okay. Mm. Um, what affects the amount of radon in the soil is, in, is the amount of radium and uranium in the content of the soil, and it, it, it's a bedrock. Type and the moisture content of the soil also affects what happens there, and the porosity and the permeability of the soil. So all those things will affect whether radon is in the soil and how it gets to you. And it, um, it's the second leading cause of lung cancer in the U.S. Um, this is from these are old numbers. I just couldn't find any newer ones. In um, twenty-one thousand deaths annually. Um, the, the study that kind of put this in perspective was a study done in Iowa of um, women, and they were women who lived on farms and they were home all the time. And so they did a, st a, a study with subject and, and, um, um, and, the, and a study group that, um, that looked at over a period of time, because it takes a long time for radon to, you don't get it overnight. It can be years before you know you have it. And these people didn't smoke, so there wasn't, there wasn't any smoke in the household. So they, they found out that yes, the radon really did cause the lung cancer. Um, so that, that's that been settled. So it's, it's the leading cause of, of cancer, lung cancer for non-smokers. Um, now, the problem is that National Academy of Sciences, their study said that even a small amount can, can give you lung cancer over a period of time. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be years before you get it. Smokers have a much higher risk than those who don't smoke. And um, they're just compromised. The lungs are compromised and easy to get in there. It's, it's formed from radioactive decay of uranium and, and, and radium. It actually, it's, they're called daughters. But it's right on progeny in your daughters that actually are what cause it. And that there's some, if, if you want to look, I've got pamphlets in there if you want a pamphlet that Josh left. 
from the Department of Health that gives you some different pictures that are easier to look at. I should, should have put some on here because it's prettier than looking at words. But the radon, they carry the small static charge that you can that can get attached to water, dust, vapor, and then we inhale it, and then they get in their lungs and stay there. So we've probably all been exposed to some in some time, and it causes damage to the tissues in the lung. Now there's this this is a completely arbitrary number. It's one that they just picked because they thought, okay, this can't be this, you know, below that, do we have, we don't have any proof. We don't have any proof that it's a good number or a bad number, but it's the number that they've settled on. So these are picocuries per liter of air. And they say that if you have levels of four or above four, um, that you should have remediation or mitigation. And you measure it with a couple ways. There's a short-term test, which I think is totally bogus, because um, the pictures in here, because it, radon has had it comes up and down in the hours of the day mm -hmm. and over the seasons. Mm -hmm. So if you measure it one time, you can get a false positive or a false negative. You don't know. I think the best way to do it is a a year study, so you go through all the seasons, and it's an average because they're looking at if you get dosed one day, it's probably not going to be that isn't going to cause the issue. It's going to be that level or the average over time of how much you're, you're exposed to, remember that dose of duration kind of thing. So a long-term test, 90 days, I say a minimum of six months, and start it in the winter so you know when your house is closed up, because that's when you're going to be most exposed. Um, you, can't, you can't ventilate the way you rain on that well. So, um, so a lot of when houses change, you know, in the last for radon test, and they'll come in and they'll do it like in 24 hours. They've got these machines that do it. I can not tell you a squat. It just, you know, you just, you really need to do a longer term test. <laughs> Told me 1.7 pico curies per liter. Well, that would be good if that were it. Right, if that were actually or, the case, or, I'm sure yeah. it's not. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's not. Yeah. So, and radon could come in any time that there are holes. And you remember the stack effect? Yeah. You know? So the stack effect is sucking it in anytime there's a hole, and we have lots of holes in it at lower levels. Um, even we try very hard not to have them, but we do. And um, coming from the soil. Um, so it, you just want to be aware of it. Um, do you think that's why we have higher radon levels here? We have higher radon levels radius? because we have higher um, uranium and radium in our soil. Mm -hmm. I've got a map that will show okay. that in just a second. I think it might be coming up soon. So the driving forces are air pressure, which is that stack effect, a little bit of um, emanation, diffusion, water aeration, very little in the water, but you can get right on the water. Um, so, okay, so here's the map. And some maps show Minnesota all this darkest color, but you can see that pretty much, and, and it's, it's very insidious to you know it, works in houses, because I do a lot of radon studies over the years, and you can have houses right next to each other, and one will be high and one will be low. Um, and it depends on all kinds of things. But, and in fact, one of the houses that was done, there were two houses built identical by the same builder, everything the same, one at a high level, one didn't. So you just, you don't know unless you test what it is. And I've had radon levels where you know, they typically say the basement's going to be the highest level, but because we take pick up that air from the basement, from the furnaces, and move it all around the house, I had one house in the study, I remember that upstairs was the highest level. Um, and it, was, it was just kind of a little old house, it was pretty leaky. But it had a second floor and a basement, and so you need to check on each level. Do you know the, the radon regulations for the existing homes? Same. Yeah. Do they uh, force you to go test it every now and then? Um, no. No. Nope. No. And you, if you, you don't change, have to, but yeah, when you uh, when you buy a house, your yeah. realtor will tell you yeah. it's a good idea to have it tested for radon, yeah. and if it tests above four liters, four people liters per curie, uh, then you write into the purchase agreement we won't buy the house unless you, you install a radon mitigation yeah. system. Yeah. So yeah. Sure. Active radon. Yeah. So it's pretty much up to you right now. Yeah. yeah. Although I, I don't know that they make it 
Uh -huh. They may get to not be active, but you have to have passive with a, with an electric <coughs> with electricity in the attic. So you can add the fan if you need to. Isn't it? Yeah. And it's in the right, new, with, house, with new, new houses. New yeah. houses. New houses. You true. have to have the passive installed mm -hmm. with electricity to add. Do you, do you know what? So let's look at the so. The strategies are sealing the basement, sealing everything out. I would put an aggregate layer underneath the slab so there's air, so it's not it's going other way other than getting in the house. Seal sump baskets, um, reduce negative pressure in the house, and prepare for future sub slab mitigation. But um, so sealing up, they're they're preparing here to. This is actually just sealed, but it's got to be sealed tight, even though it's not concrete. It's a, a poly of some kind. Um, sealed very tight. All the seams have to be sealed. Everything so nothing comes in. Um, the this joint needs to be sealed, which we're trying to get done in new houses. So is this uh, assuming that the concrete is um, is not so porous that it will let a significant Diffuse. amount through? Yeah, it's it's really it really comes in more in the holes. Okay. Yeah. Um, the you get the moisture diffusing, but not as much as the okay. air. Yeah. So essentially, that this is looking at pathways and ways it gets in. But I think we've got to get them on. Okay. So I I really had I struggled to find a good one that isn't messy. But essentially, what what you have to do for the mitigation in new homes, it's much easier because they're putting that rock and they and they were able to get all the the um, you get connection with all underneath the slab. But older homes that didn't have rock or they're just sitting on soil, there's always a layer between the soil and the concrete. There's always a layer of air in there. And what they try and do is they dr they'll drill holes in the corners to make sure that you can get the pressure. And then they'll decide where the best place to put it is. And sometimes I, I, don't, I, I don't like them on the outside for a number of reasons, but, but they'll find a place inside where they can put, they can connect all the air here underneath that. And then it'll stack effect, whoops, here it is. The stack effect will take it out. Um, or you can put a fan in the attic that will suck it out, a very low fan. And that's what that's essentially what they're trying to do. So that little pocket of air is how it gets like, sucked yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. But if, if you're creating that pressure underneath there, yeah. That that's what's actually taking it out. Yeah, and then it dissipates in the air. Yeah. yeah. Passive, does it actually work well? Like, Passive actually works pretty well. They'll test to see, make sure they're getting yeah. pressurized. Yeah. Yeah. And you can also there's there's a little pressure gauge on them that actually will show you what the pressure is on them, mm. so you know you're getting pressure. Are those supposed to be installed on all the passive systems or? Yes, I, I, well, I, on the new code, you mean? Yeah. I'm not sure. I, I think so, but I'll have to check on that. I'm not sure, but I will check on that. Okay, particulates. Um, PM, particulates, particles, little solid particles and liquid droplets in the air. Um, acids, nitrates, sulfates, organic chemicals, metals, soil, dust particles, all those kinds of things that can easily get um, ingested, ingested, or just you breathe in. Um, some are large enough you can see them, but some are just you need an electronic mic electron microscope to to see that you can't see them to look at them. So the size are directly linked to to what kind of damage they can do. The small ones, less than 10 micrometers, and I think I've got a picture of a hair in here that you can see what that is. Um, they're the biggest problem because they can get down in our lungs and get stuck. Uh, we can't cough them up. They, they just, they cling, they get a hold of something and stay on there. And some can even get in your bloodstream. So you want to, you know, that, that's those pictures of that woman we saw at the very beginning with a mask on her face that, you know, when you get in a, a situation like that where you know it's not moisture in the air, although even with moisture, they're gonna, that moisture is going to pick up some of the particulates and you're still going to get it, but where you're in an industrial third world country where, where there's a lot of stuff going. So this is a human hair, and this is a 10 um, microns. 
so the fattest part of your hair, it just that's how small they are. And that those are the ones that cause real damage smaller than that. Any and a fine piece of beach sand here, they're showing it at 90 microns. So that's fine, very fine. So which you can ingest too if you get volleyball or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So these um, so this is a photo, you can kind of see the difference here, same place, one day and another day. Um, the, you know, that you can see why, because if you've lived long enough, and you guys have it, to remember when California looked like this in the mornings, and it wasn't just this, well, it was smog, but it wasn't fog coming in, and um, so that you can, you know, you can kind of get a feel for it, but sometimes it's hard. And the people in some of those cities can't get away from it. They tell them to stay inside, but you know that they're also getting dosed inside, too. So particulates are. Um, so they, where does it come from? The burning process, smoking, the smog, industrial process, breakdown of organic materials, just, you know, it, it's all kind of circular. Um, facts, I knew, I use no nose, throat, respiratory infections, lung cancer, all those kinds of things. So what do we do? Well, for us in our homes, we can eliminate the combustion sources so we can go to the power venting and use some kind of um, ventilation um, to bring what we think is better outside air, but you also have to know where you are just to know whether your outside air is better. We missed the candles. Oh. I'll back and do it for you. You videotaped it, though. We're getting, yeah. <laughs> we're getting, we're getting done with the end, I think. So um, high efficiency air in, uh, filtration. Um, this is where filtration does make a difference. Um, these are most of the reductions that we see come from federal mandates on this. So Clean Air Act, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay. Uh, all of this is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> For both of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, this, this, I like this one because it talked about all oh, this crap that's in there, you guys. Yeah, that's good stuff. <laughs> Look at this. Is there DDT Fine. in cigarettes? What? DDT? Yeah. Oh. What is that? Insecticide. Insecticide. Yeah. So that's what they put in bug spray. That's acetone, deep. acetone, like can <laughs> do your nails yeah. with. <laughs> yep. How much better is this electronics? What is, uh, they're saying take a lot of that stuff out? Um, I think some of that, but they're also saying there are other issues with that, and I really haven't studied that. But yeah. the latest the latest stuff is it's not much better for you. Just a different it's Why a different bag. So many chemicals in there. I mean it started off with, you know, the cowboys rolled tobacco that you got from the field. How did it get to this? I'm just curious. Same word. Yeah. Flavor. Yeah, the flavor of arsenic. <laughs> 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 Oh, I wonder if there's any difference between like the, like the hand rolled uh, tobacco that you would buy at a tobacco store and a uh, Marlboro Light. I can't, I can't do that. None of it is good for you. No, because right. it, it's still affecting your lungs. Okay, I have another picture for you. Well, I'm in it. Okay, um, proximity of those who do smoke. That's the big thing. Okay, there you go. So this is just somebody smoking in that room. How many of you have ever been to a bar at midnight when they could still smoke? Now you guys yeah, are getting enough that you have been to a bar when some of them. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's like blue. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And you it's it's disgusting. go you home and you, and you smell just, you just take your clothes off outside and run and make it. And yeah. Which <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. after the bar you should be anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, All right, here, you guys. You did, look at this. Somebody else's house. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Look at that. Now, the good news, if you stop smoking, you actually can clear up a lot of that. That'll go back, huh? Yeah. It does, it does get better. I have a question. Yeah. Tomorrow. So yeah. the apartment yeah. that I rented, I just moved in in November, and the guy before me, they, they just went to a smoke-free building, but the guy before me smoked. Mm -hmm. And so I'm still, after you know two, three months now, trying to get rid of that smell. I do a lot of baking soda on the carpet, and then I do, I have this. You should ask for them to replace the carpet. 
Yeah. Did they repaint everything? They repainted everything. And um, my guess is that the carpet's probably the last yeah. place, but you know, it'll... Um, and then I heard sage, so I have sage now that I have just sitting mm -hmm. out like potpourri. Um, <laughs> that's just covering up, though. Yeah. It's not taking it out. Does the baking soda? I, they every actually, time I vacuum, I, I vacuum once a week because I have cats, too, so, and allergies, yeah, so. Yeah. I vacuum once a week and I use baking cats soda. Cats and allergies in a smoking apartment. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, I eat you really well and balanced, so I don't really... Yeah feel the effects a lot. I do a lot of natural things, so I've okay. counteracted a lot of that. But, um... Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, um, does that probably replacing the carpet would probably help because it's real tough to get. That might be a place where if they took out the whole place and had it all <laughs> ozone full, nobody was in there. Because ozone has a, a lifespan that's pretty short. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but... And you got to wonder if they actually painted the ceilings as well. Yeah, Usually the they ceilings, just paint the walls. Yeah. And the cabinets, and inside the cabinets, and all that right. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, suck, it gets into everything. everything. It gets into everything. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's good um, stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing, isn't it? Oh, here's another one. I think it's just for you, Chad. <laughs> Thanks. And you, Graham. Thanks. It's a good one. Not to single anybody out or anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're tough. Like, there's a woman who smokes below me, but oh. the tenant was saying it's really difficult for them to, like, prove that they're smoking in their house. Take a picture of her and send you. Seriously. <laughs> Bust down her door. <laughs> 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 I mean, you have a no-smoking policy in that. In yeah, that they have a no-smoking policy, but, like, they said it's hard to... Really? I guess she. I no, guess not that hard. Yeah. Well, all right. They just yeah. don't. They. I. Talk about I don't think she's gonna find a lawsuit. You walk in. Yep. Yep. They either are or they aren't. You could do an air test too, but. But they. You need to move. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Or they do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if but if your yeah. landlord isn't willing to come out. Um. All right, lead poisoning. All right, who's familiar with a lot of the lead poisoning and what the issues are? Okay, we'll run through this quickly for a couple of you guys. Okay, um, even, you know, lead, 20 years ago, lead was even a much bigger issue because we really weren't aware of it as much. I, I can say that a lot of people that I've worked with at the university and some projects that I actually research, I probably, I actually worked on, um, with lead, um, they have done a very good job of of removing lead from older homes, particularly in low-income areas, um, because they've just put a lot of money into it and a lot of research. And um, um, I remember carrying around an XRF machine that it, it will go through. Um, we had to hire somebody because it was such an expensive piece; they wouldn't let us use it. <laughs> to, that it'll tell you if lead, you'll go through the wall and tell you if there's lead behind it. Yeah. Any paint that's covering it and cool. things like that. Okay, like x-ray diffraction? Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't actually know the how exactly how it works, but that's what it does. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. um, even small amounts of lead can cause some serious health problems. Children in the under age of six are, six are particularly vulnerable. I think I think it's just because they're, they're, they're just so developing. And everything is kind of fresh, and you know. Isn't um, the elderly affected? And elderly, elderly affected, but people in particular jobs. I remember one movie because we used to carry around movies and show them. Mm. And this one guy who was the, um, who was, he he ran a, um, a target range, mm. and he he all of a sudden became very irritated and agitated, and they they thought, oh my gosh, what's happened to him? And they tested his blood, and he had high levels of lead because of the lead from after the shooting, mm -hmm. it would get in the air and he was there all day long and things like that. And sad, sad stories about people renovating old houses mm -hmm. with kids in them and didn't know it. And kids got, got lead poisoning and again, lead poisoning doesn't go away. It's a, it's a, it's, high levels can be fatal, but even small levels can Low be. Low levels can almost be worse. Low when low levels can Yep. When was lead paint? Like, when did they stop using it? 78. However, 1978. However, they knew the effects long before then. Yeah. They yeah. They just and you yeah, still can get lead for some things like 
um, like farm equipment and stuff you uh -huh. can let paint for. But they didn't take everything off the shelf in 78. Uh -huh. Think of how many gallons of paint yeah. are still on the shelf in 78. Yeah, yeah just thinking about the future. I'd like to get a house and try to avoid one that has a bunch of paint in it. Well, good, it's, good luck it's, with that. It's, yeah. it's tough. Now, you can cover it. You, know, you can cover it. and But every time, if the windows are painted, every time you open that window, you get a little nope. bit of dust coming down from it. And um, so you have to be very vigilant. And that's one of the things that the research did was teach people in those types of houses because they. They don't all tend to be. Some of them are very expensive, big old fancy houses like I used to live by in Crocus Hill. That, um, but they being clean and how you clean it, you clean it with a wet rag. Again, you make sure that there aren't dust. You, you take your rugs and you shape, put them by the door so when people come in from outside, they, their feet don't carry it, that kind of thing. So there's all kinds of strategies mm -hmm. to reduce the amount. Um, and it also could be in the drinking water. So I used to collect drinking water and go out and collect soil and, and do all the um, collecting of stuff and take it back in and, and a couple of the studies. Um, unless you take all that stuff out and you have to be very careful to do it and you have to be careful how you get rid of it, it has to be bagged, you have to suit up, all that kind of thing. It's, it's, um, it's amazing what we can do ourselves. I said, we don't even know what we're doing now with all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. Who knows? We'll find out. Okay. Um, okay, this is the scary part. Between 75 and 95 percent of this inhaled stays in your body for life. Um, yeah. It's where the term. Uh, uh, Paletto? Paletto. Yeah, that and uh, did you eat paint chips when you were little? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we did. That's the other thing. That's the other thing. It it's sweet. very sweet. Mm -hmm. So kids would gnaw on the windowsills because <laughs> it was very sweet. Well, I didn't know it had a, a sweet flavor. It had, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does. Please I saw so the yummy food. boy. <laughs> Did you saw a picture of your kids? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, and lead fumes, you know, and the, we still have lead gas. You can adjust it with that. Um, here. Okay, so here, loss of appetite, fatigue, cramps, constipation, ankle. Loss of power, you can lose um, uh, neurologically. Anemia, the one that is, and then death. Um, actually, I I went into my doctor. I've had a couple spells of loss of hearing, and and um, because I was doing all that research and stuff, I went into my ENT doctor, who my husband used to work with, and and um, he said, okay, we're checking your blood because that can cause you can have a loss of hearing from like poisoning too, um, and it was acute like that, and it, well, luckily it was not that, but yeah, okay. Is it easy to test blood for lead? For mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you can just, just, just go and draw some blood and they'll tell you, yeah, because it's going to be everywhere. It isn't, yeah. Uh, neurological damage, mental retardation, weight of disabilities, hyperactivity, kidney damage, and immune system, I mean, it, it just, bad news. Okay, testing. Um, chelation is a therapy, but it's only in very extreme cases, and then again, it binds with the lead and helps the body get rid of it, but that doesn't repair any damage. It's already been done. By the time you get to the point where they're looking at chelation, you've probably had a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, this is the good news, and that's why we don't hear so much about it anymore. Um, because here's this is from 1997 to uh, 2014. Um, these are the numbers that were tested and then the percent confirmed. And when did they start? I assume it kind of looks like 2011 when they um, uh, started making all contractors be lead certified if they were going to do any kind of. You know, I, I don't, work I can't remember. I, it seems to me it was maybe before that where they started to do some of that, but now they've upped it. And I just read today that that they're changing them again, and you have to get recertified if you were if you were re, if you were certified before 2010, you have to get recertified. Shoot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the most boring class ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they added an L, P P L. I forget. Mm -hmm. what the letters were, but they added a letter at the front of them to make it different than the certification you have in there. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that's good news, but that doesn't help any individual that's in an old house with lead. Mm -hmm. You do need to be aware of that. Well, and if you, I've seen uh, charts that go back a lot further than 97, like back to the 70s. Yeah. And, you know, it started a hell of a lot oh, higher yeah. than that. Oh, yeah. It did. It did. Well, I mean, in that, that 78, I mean, it did, I mean, that, it was, I mean, when they finally figured it out, I'm sure people knew it before that, but when, when you can get the system to actually act. Right. And say, yeah, once, okay, we've got to do something yeah. about this. Once, once mm -hmm. the, uh, the clean yeah. air standards and the, yep. you know, the lead paint ban was. happened, it was pretty precipitous. Yeah. There was a scientist, I remember seeing a documentary, it was very interesting, I don't remember the name, he's a famous scientist. I know who you mean, but I can't think of his name and, right Yes, now. and he discovered the effects, the bad effects of lead poisoning. He yep. was trying to yep. tell everybody, yep. but all these companies would come to oh, him yeah. and pay him off and say, no, you can't share these results. And, <laughs> And all this, there's all these politics behind it. Oh, it yeah, such a it was. Industry. Yep. No. It, what is it? Yeah. yeah. Right. Same with pharmaceuticals. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Petrochemicals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, this one I think I put out because it was looking at the levels. Um, this is Minnesota. Um, so the population less than 72 months old, so these are kids. The number of kids tested, the total confirmed, and the percentage. So it's, see, I mean. So from 5% yeah. of kids tested with, you know, yep. blood lead levels yep. greater than 10 micrograms per liter. Yeah. You know, from 5% to a quarter of a percent. Yep. So, so we're, we're getting, trivial. no, it's not trivial. It's not trivial, but that doesn't mean we need we need to, I know my daughter and her husband had the whole house paint not stripped but painted mm -hmm. over. But now some of that's chipping because they have three kids and a yeah. bungalow. Um, so, yeah. Oh, asbestos. <laughs> the good stuff. I'm pretty sure I have that too. Yeah, asbestos is another. My dad was a brakeman on the railroad and he also smoked till he was 50 and he died of lung cancer and I'm sure it was. You don't say. Yeah, it's shocking, huh? Yeah. That's exciting. It could be 80, though. Um, it's naturally occurring. It, it can be only identified under a microscope, so you can't hold it in your hand and say what it is, because um, it looks like a lot of other things. Um, they're flexible. They, they are flexible. The different types are flexible. They're fire resistant. The reason they're in so many products is because they're really a damn good fire retardant and insulated. Um, there's more than three, 30, 30, excuse me, 3,000, and you can see that little picture. So it was used because of that with fire, fire resistant properties, added to strengthen them, and you know, gloves, even, even people had, well, hop hats in the house had asbestos in them. The mitts that you used had asbestos in them. It, Break pads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, and it, if, it's, if it is bound, it can't release, but all these things get worn and they get moved and they get used, so so it does get in the air. Um, okay, stays in the lungs. Again, this is another one that you don't you don't get you don't die from it immediately. You die from it 20, 30 years later after it stays in the lungs, depending on the dosage. So hair dryers had them for insulation. Textured paints had them. Drywall, it's drywall on here. Um, drywall, particularly that from Mexico, or, um, had asbestos in it. Ceiling tiles like this had asbestos in it. It's still out there. I just am sending today three samples in, two from my top, top at Hopper's house and one from our house in Duluth because I want to know if it has asbestos and if it does, save some more money. <laughs> <laughs> a friend just bought a house with Sin uh, yes, Did he have it tested? No. Well, if it's you can you can usually tell the products that have it. Kind of, except it looks a lot like this. Yeah. I mean, how can you tell? You uh, the ceiling tiles are a little bit different, a little bit more difficult, but uh, floor tiles and floor siding tiles, yeah. and of course for Mickey Light. Yeah. Uh, those are all pretty easy to. Yeah, the flooring was a particular size. Was it twelve inch? Or it was twelve inch. Twelve inch. And a lot of the other vinyl tiles were not that big, and it, it's brittle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you you can if it cracks, you know, it'll crack. 
but there were sailing ties too that I mean when I looked at the pictures on the new and the old, I couldn't tell them apart. But the sailing ties? Sailing ties, yeah. Because mm -hmm. they look just like the new ones. Yeah. This so here's one. A lot of the new ones look just like that. Mm -hmm. And that's one that does have it. This of course is they they put it on pipes in the basement. Usually white in color. Yeah, it's usually white in color, yeah. Ooh, we're way past time. Yeah, I just okay. the time I gotta go to the other people can take the one. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, Thank you. And the, 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 big, is yeah, the big one. <laughs> is, the big one. <laughs> <laughs> is this my map? What is it here? Yeah. So <laughs> this is Zonalite, which is the insulation that's in the attics of a lot of old houses that had vermiculite. It's vermiculite, but it has asbestos in it. Um, and you can't tell by looking. So, and it was in all of these things. I mean, it, it, like 3,000 things, and that's just part of it. Remember once Al found a posting on Craigslist, someone had pulled insulation from above, like, their, like a porch on the front of their house. <laughs> and they're trying to resell it? And they're trying to, like, give it away. Sell it or get rid of it. And I was like, it looks like vermiculite. <laughs> <laughs> they still sell vermiculite. Yeah, they still well, sell vermiculite. You can still buy it. It yeah. looks like old vermiculite that probably needs it. Yeah, no, so it, it was basically just one point of time, um, a mine like, in Montana. Mine in Montana. It's not the only one, but that's the big one. Yeah. Yeah. But we had lots of it here because there was... Most a, of it came a, here. Here. <laughs> so, and, and I know oh. people who used to play on those piles of it. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some of them are still alive. So vermiculite's fine, other than the fact that... Vermiculite itself, it's the asbestos. But, but yeah. it's a challenge to that. I have the state's presentation on it that's pretty... What is yeah. asbestos exactly? What's um, actually, do I have a picture of it in here? Shoot. It, it, it looks like a shiny... Um, I'll send you a picture of it. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture in here. I'm not sure why. Maybe. What asbestos or, or what like, vermiculite? It was like vermiculite. You said not all, not all vermiculite has asbestos in right. it. So right. like, why but is it in some but not others? Because this mine put it in there. Because the mine was from an area that had a bunch of asbestos in the in the rock. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, it, it looks like anything else. It looks like a. a a rock that's been cut up and sliced uh -huh. up and yeah. kind of whitish, goldish. Kind of whitish, goldish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can put a picture of it on the video later. Yeah. Can you? Will you? Yeah, I've sure. got them. I don't know why it's not on. Send it my way. Look at all the other pictures I've got. How did I miss <laughs> that? Um, so asbestosis is scars of the lungs can lead to breathing problems, heart failure. Um, worked in manufacturing asbestos on the railroad. Mesothelioma. Um, um, it's a rare cancer, but that can lead to all kinds of problems. And um, what's his name? Con um, politician here who worked in those mines, lived in that area of town where they manufactured that insulation. And um, gosh, I can't think of his name. There's a park named after him, but he was he was really a, a good guy, and he ended up with Mrs. Paul Wilson. Mm -hmm. Nope. Mm -hmm. um, he was a plane crash. Um, I'll think of it, maybe. <laughs> um, you can look it up. So you have to have a test in the lab. You can't tell it. You can't. We think we can recognize it, but we really can't. I mean, we can't be sure right. because we might miss it. So it has to be tested in the lab. And um, it's there's, there's it's one a one particular siding that you do know for sure. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Well, if you do know the product, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't attempt to remove it. If you've got it, if you've got that hanging stuff in the basement, you really probably should have somebody come in and remove it. But if you've got a nice, clean, if you've got an older house and a nice, clean um, pipe that's covered with asbestos and it's not, the only way it can hurt you is when it's called friable, when it gets in the air. So if it's all sealed and taped and it's really solid, don't mess with it. Leave it. And that's for the piping stuff, all this other stuff. What's funny is that it's not against the law for you yourself to right. remove it from your house. Yeah. But it's against the law for any contractor to do it without having a license to drive yeah. with it. Right. So yeah. you can go and dig in your vermiculite, but a contractor. Yeah. Can have. And back in the eighties they started licensing people to do that and go through the process and that. So um and here's yeah, don't remove it by yourself, get a contractor. It's expensive. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, expensive as hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So these are the last couple things. There's there's a there's an air quality index that reports the daily thing. These are the things you hear like don't go out today or or you know those kinds of things. Um, it focuses on health effects. They calculate four major air pollutants, so it's limited to what they're looking at, and they're looking at ground level ozone, um, particulate pollution, carbon monoxide, and sulfur dioxide. So it's limited to those. Um, and these are kind of the numbers you're looking at. So, but these are ones that I think we hear about and we know. We don't have as much here as some cities do. How bad does it get in China? Um, my guess is it gets down in um, here. Yeah. I know, I know it does. Yeah. Yeah. At times. And then there's, I just want you to be aware of this. This is a clean air, this is talking a little bit about the Clean Air Act. This, unfortunately, is fraught with political mayhem. Let's, <laughs> let's say that. Um, the Clean Air Act was last amended in 1990. Um, it requires the EPA to set these national ambient air quality standards for pollutants. And they're into two separate areas. One is for public health protection, um, like sensitive populations, children, elderly. And the other one is about the welfare, public welfare protection. So it talks about decreased visibility and damaged animals, cross vegetation, stuff like that. So it's been just a real challenge to, um, because there were all ways you could, that they didn't, they didn't administer it very well. And they kept giving them, they said, okay, you have to do this, and then they'd push it off, and they'd push it off, and they'd push it off, and people wouldn't do it. And so you just, I just want you to be aware that that's there, that these regional um, national ambient air quality standards. So they, they just have failed to meet it, and they haven't done anything about it. That's really what happened. So, and we're still fighting about it. So. Just, you know, we're trying, but somebody's trying and somebody's not. We made it! Three! Lisa, are you still there? She I'm still here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in there. <laughs> I appreciate you, Tom, for speaking.